nation. And some of these events, again, like the two witnesses uh, that were there uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem that were not able to be harmed by the Antichrist and were protected by God, and they're able there to, uh, to be preaching and sharing the gospel in Jerusalem during that first three and a half years. Uh, those guys then are killed by the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation. So we looked at that. So that's an event that was going on and culminated in the middle of the tribulation. Some of the other things we looked at happened in the middle of the tribulation and then continue to have effect uh, into the second half of the tribulation. We're looking at one of those uh, events here uh, this, uh, this morning in terms of the rise of, of the false prophet. Now remember, a couple of weeks ago, we, we looked at... Um, in our study, the fact that uh, Satan at that point in time will have one more <coughs> frontal assault, literally in terms of warfare, against the throne of God. And, uh, and Michael and his holy angels would put down that rebellion. And Satan at that point will be cast down to earth. And he's just a little bit ticked off at, at that point, as he's described as a fiery red dragon. And at that point, he will uh, again unleash his fury against especially uh, the Jewish people in particular because he understands prophecy and he understands that what brings Jesus Christ back to planet earth is when the Jewish remnant cries out and recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah. <clears throat> Remember Jesus said <coughs> over Jerusalem that uh, because their, <coughs> their national leaders had, uh, had rejected them, not the Jewish people, but the national leaders had rejected him as a nation. Uh, and so he said to them, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, a messianic uh, quotation till they recognize he's the Messiah. And of course, they will do that at the end of the tri tribulation period. And they will look on the one that they have pierced and mourned for him as one mourns for an only son. <laughs> that brings Jesus Christ back to planet earth and Satan knows that. So therefore, if he can destroy the Jewish people, he can prevent the return of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom, and he can continue to reign, as Paul calls him, the prince of, of the air and the, uh, the prince of this world. And uh, you don't have to look too long in the news uh, in the evening to find out that that is, is true. Certainly God in his sovereignty is still uh, ruling, but uh, we live in a time when there is certainly evil here on planet earth. Uh, so Satan is furious as he's cast out of heaven, and he's even more furious then because as Jesus instructed and warned that when, when the Jewish people see that happening in the middle of the tribulation, and they see the rise of the Antichrist, the person we're going to talk about this morning, the false prophet, they should flee into the Judean wilderness, and they will, and God will supernaturally protect them. Uh, as they go, remember there's going to be that Navy SEAL team that helps them get to the C-17s and that flight, either that or God supernaturally protects them, one of the two, uh, and gets them out there. And uh, Satan comes after them like a flood, uh, and God, uh, again, watches over them. Then he's really furious because, in a sense, he knows he's doomed, and he will turn and unleash his fury uh, against uh, the rest of the Jewish people that are on the planet at that time. And, uh, and he, will, he will kill two-thirds of the Jewish people on the planet uh, during that last half of the three-and-a-half-year periods. And, of course, there's a worldwide revival going on, too, because there's 144,000 uh, Jewish evangelists that have uh, received uh, Jesus, Yeshua, as, as uh, Hamashiach, as their Messiah, and they're sealed by God, and they are protected, and they're out sharing the gospel in every tribe and language uh, on the planet. Everybody's going to hear the gospel. There's a worldwide revival going on. But as people receive Christ, they're martyred for their faith. And we've looked at a couple of scenes so far of what we call the tribulation saints uh, in heaven. We're going to see another reference to them as we continue in the coming weeks uh, in our study as well. So there's a lot uh, going on. And of course, we'll come back maybe after the first of the year, and I'll put up some PowerPoint slides and kind of go over some of the timeline of these events, because that's going to be on your midterm. Did I mention that? But uh, So I want to bring you up to speed, uh, just so you can, sometimes it helps to see it all, all laid out. We've covered a lot of things so far uh, in our study. But uh, last week, then, we saw that uh, Satan, in his fury then, then in a sense, <laughs> raises up the Antichrist, who is this world leader. Again, his we say Antichrist, but we're just saying 
a Greek word in English, antichristo. So we're seeing the word anti means instead of. He's instead of the Messiah. He's like a Messiah. He's not going to come on the scene as a bad guy. He's going to become a good guy. He's going to bring peace, <clears throat> be the friend of Israel for that first three and a half years. He's going to solve a lot of problems, a lot of economic problems, a lot of strife and wars that are around the world. He's going to have a solution for them, uh, and he's going to be hailed as a great hero. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we have the connotation when we say Antichrist, you know, boo, but that's not what the world's going to say. They're going to say, yay, you know. I don't think they're going to call him that. They're going to probably call him George or Harry or something, whatever his name is. I don't think they're going to call him George the Antichrist. I think they're going to be, you know, uh, have a much better name for him than uh, we would refer to him. And, uh, and Satan brings him on the scene and gives him his authority and his power and his throne. We saw that last week. We're going to see that same authority now given to the false prophet. So we truly have an unholy trinity ruling during the tribulation time because we've got Satan uh, we've got the Antichrist, and we've got a false prophet. And just like the Holy Spirit's, uh, one of his main ministries is certainly to bring attention and all glory to the Messiah, then uh, the, the false prophet will do the same. Part of what he's all about is to draw attention, religious attention, to the Antichrist so that people will, will worship him, and he will certainly be a catalyst to the, uh, catalyst to the instigation of that worship taking place. Let's take a look and we'll read our, our text. And, and of course, this is, a, is an interesting one because we get at the end of verse 17 and 18 uh, a reference to, to who the, uh, the Antichrist is in terms of uh, he has a number assigned to his name, which is 666. So using that numerical value at the end of the message, I will break the name down and give you a picture and a description of who the Antichrist is. I'll have it for you in the PowerPoint. won't have to worry about it anymore. I've got it for you this morning. And, uh, and as well, we'll talk about this idea of the mark of the beast and some of the recent things that have come out in the news to show how close we are and how that, uh, the products are there, uh, the cooperation among governments are there. Uh, it's all set. It's all ready to go. Well, let's look at our text, verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose uh, deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell in the earth uh, by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for that is the number of a man, his number is... 666. So first we note that the false prophet will have power to influence the world. And again, our text says he comes up out of the earth. And uh, in the Greek there, it says uh, he is another beast. And it means another of the same kind. It could be another of a different kind, but it's of the same kind in terms of the, uh, the Antichrist him, himself. Again, the word beast is used 36 times uh, in, in Revelation alone, describing sometimes Satan, sometimes describing the Antichrist, sometimes describing the false prophets. But we've got a couple of uh, distinctions here because this guy comes up not out of the sea, the sea of humanity, as we saw the Antichrist, but out of the earth. And I think this is probably just in contrast as a religious leader. He's not coming from heaven. You know, there's a, God is not behind this at all. This is a, a, a false system. Uh, I've already mentioned his other name, but we get it from Revelation 19.20. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped uh, his, his image. So he is the false prophet. Now Jesus, as well as the writers in the New Testament, warned us about false prophets in terms of plural. Jesus said in Matthew 24.11, 
Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. But uh, the good news is their destiny is in Revelation 19, 19. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So that's where they end up. But he is on the scene. He'll have tremendous influence. Notice he has two horns like a lamb but speaks like a dragon. So therefore they call him Rambo. No, that's not what they do. But it's a little, a little strange here. We got a lamb with horns. Lambs do not normally have horns, much less they don't speak like a dragon. So what's this all about? Well, again, horns, even throughout the Old Testament, we see it in the, in the Proverbs, we see it in Psalms. It's just a symbol of power. So he's going to have two realms of power. Certainly one of them is religious, and so we would assume the other is political. So he's going to have authority and great authority in two realms, politically uh, and religiously. Uh, and also he'll again speak, we would say, as a deceiver because he'll speak with the mouth of a dragon. Well, the dragon identified in chapter 12 as Satan. So we have like a lamb, we associate lamb with religious things, lambs of sacrifice and so forth, a reference to Jesus many times in the book, uh, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he's going to come like a Messiah, a religious figure, He's going to have tremendous influence in two realms, politically and religiously, but it's Satan that is actually speaking uh, through, his, through his voice. That's who the dragon is. Now, again, John, our same writer in his epistle, talks about the fact that the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. Uh, there's already a, a, out there a world system that is against Jesus, that is uh, against us having a relationship with him, that is against us proclaiming the gospel and telling the other people the truth. And we need to be careful because the spiritual deception that will be so rampant through his ministry exists already today. And we're warned about it many times in scripture. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 11, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. And in that case, Paul's very concerned about those that would, uh, again, leave the simplicity that our faith in Jesus Christ, his grace shown to us, the forgiveness that he gives us, we would see that as sufficient for our salvation and that we would begin to rely on, on works and doing other things and other rituals and, uh, and so forth. He says, it's like Eve. Eve was deceived with, with crafty intent. I know we read the story of Adam and Eve, and it kind of seems like, so what is up, Eve? I mean, the, you know, the serpent comes along, says a couple of deals, and you just you know, bite the dust? Come on. <laughs> but again, Satan is very skilled in what he did. The, the point is, you or I would do no better <laughs> than Adam and Eve. They were both perfect from the hand of God, having just created them, had this incredible relationship with the Lord, and yet they were both deceived. They were no match for Satan, and neither are you or I will be deceived. Uh, we need to make sure that, uh, again, it's the Lord that stands before us. That when Satan comes knocking on the door, we allow Jesus to answer, uh, and uh, really not, uh, not ourselves. So we're warned about spiritual deception. Uh, just like Eve was, Eve was deceived, and certainly there's lots of attacks out there, and we live in uh, what many have referred to now in the United States, a post-Christian era, uh, where, again, we're constantly, or, or at least on a regular basis, kinda, kind of uh, trounced in the media, you know, all of the, you know, you got the mass murderer, you know, but the one thing he's got in common is he's got a King James Bible under his shoulder as he goes. I mean, so you've got always in the media, you've got these, uh, the bad guys. Fortunately, you know, once in a while the media gets it right. There's a great, really good movie uh, out there called Blindside right now where it's about a Christian family and they do a wonderful thing in uh, adopting a young man and he's able to go on and play in the NFL and he's having a great uh, year this year. It's a good it's a good movie, and uh, it's like, hey, praise the Lord. You know, the Christians aren't the bad guys, you know, for once in terms of uh, Hollywood's perspective and so forth. But many times they are, uh, and many times our friends and neighbors get a wrong impression of what Christianity is, uh, is all, all about. We were, uh, again, continue to pray for our, our lease uh, here in the, in the building and so forth. But back in about June, when I met with a new property manager, said he was having trouble with the, uh, the owner of the facility because uh, she wasn't concerned. She was concerned about whether or not she wanted those kind of people leasing here in, in the building. 
I, I started to say, those kind of people, you mean the ones that start orphanages, the ones that are sending millions of dollars and thousands of volunteers to help with AIDS victims and AIDS uh, orphans uh, in Africa, the ones like the people from our church that are in Afghanistan teaching women and children how to read and write and giving them Medicare. Is the, are those the people we're talking about here? But we're not often portrayed that way in terms of the reality of, of who Christians are uh, in their place and influence and in the world that we live in. But uh, spiritual deception, he'll have the character of a lamb, but the voice of a dragon. And, uh, and certainly that spiritual deception, that influence against Christ is in the world today. And again, the lamb will use religion though as his cloak as Satan often has done. Again, the lamb being a, a religious uh, symbol. Uh, thirdly, he exercises all the authority of the first beast and again, according to verse 2, the, the dragon gave the, the first beast his authority. Satan gave the Antichrist his authority. Now the Antichrist gives the false prophet all of his authority and power as well. And it will be his, ch his chief purpose uh, in order to, to bring people in the world that are part of a, what will be a world, a one world government, but also a one world religious system. And they'll be able to bring people along. He'll be the the chief sponsor, again, a prophet that will draw people into uh, worship of Satan himself. Uh, David Hawking says this about this world system that is coming. As Christians, we should be wary of all attempts to promote world government, either through economics, politics, or religion. According to Bible prophecy, it is satanic. Without the rule of the Messiah, world government is doomed to failure. It is Satan's plan and will result in the persecution and the death of believers. And it's being talked about on the nightly news, if, you, if you're listening, uh, that uh, what we need now, and I'll quote one of the, the, the author of this whole concept of a, uh, of a world economic system, uh, and that's what's being proposed right now, being pushed uh, everywhere from China uh, to the elite uh, in, in Europe and other parts of the world, that the way we'll solve the comet the current economic crisis is through a one world currency. We're, we're moving very rapidly in the direction that we're talked about. And I agree with, that, with David when he says we should oppose as Christians any move towards a one world government because it's going to bring, it is satanic and it will bring the death of believers. And we're going to see a little bit of that uh, here in our text. So the false prophet will have power to influence the world. Secondly, uh, he'll be an imposter who deceives. We see that in verse 13. And he does that by performing great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So in other words, uh, this is a, a type of miracle that, uh, say, done by Elijah in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, he will come along and try to and be very successful at duplicating miracles that only God could do. And this will lead to great deception. It has in the past, it is today, it will continue to be in, in the future. I know Kathy and I, when we uh, were first kind of dating, engaged, and leading up to getting married, we, by, between the two of us, we had kind of been through about every cult and ism that was, uh, uh, that was out there. I think we covered about all of them. Uh, but one of the ones that we were involved uh, in at the time uh, that was really, you would classify it as part of the New Age movement, uh, you know, I had grown up in the church, but I really didn't know much in terms of, of the Bible and everything. You know, I was a little leery of this particular uh, book and its teaching and so forth. But after all, the woman that was teaching it was a Sunday school teacher. And, uh, and uh, she even looked a little bit like my old Sunday school teacher. I mean, if you can't trust your Sunday school teacher, a Sunday school teacher, who can you trust? Uh, and after all, it was a book about Jesus it said things we didn't know from the Bible, uh, you know, and uh, it was very interesting, fascinating. And as you read it, you had to believe that this book was supernaturally given. It was so detailed. And of course, there are other people in that group and other followers that had experienced uh, supernatural events and experiences in their life as a result of studying this and being part of the New Age movement. Hey, it was supernatural. There were things that were happening. It was about Jesus. It was a Sunday school teacher... Why would I doubt? But again, spiritual, spiritual deception. The false prophet is an imposter who deceives. He's going to be able to do some, some pretty big time stuff in terms of signs. Notice it says great signs uh, and, and wonders. 
There's a lot of people in, in Western society that are duped into following uh, Indian gurus in particular uh, because they are able to do some supernatural things. And they are. Some might be fakes, but a lot of them can do it. Uh, and it certainly does draw attention to themselves. Uh, it's all going to be pale compared to uh, the false prophet. Jesus warned in Matthew 24, 24, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you uh, beforehand. So performing great uh, deceptive signs. Paul says this about the false prophet, referring to him uh, under a number, another name called the lawless one. He says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. He's going to be really good. He's going to be really good at it. And it, uh, just like it does today, supernatural stuff, supernatural experiences draws people in and really, really deceives them. It's true outside of the church. It's true inside the church uh, as well. Secondly, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by these signs. And uh, notice he'll do these signs in the sight of, of the beast. So uh, again, the devil can perform the miraculous and, and deceive people. But uh, a miracle is no proof uh, that somebody is, uh, is from, from God. I remember uh, coming out of that background and then certainly uh, wanting to read things that, uh, that showed me the, you know, how the deception occurs. And I remember reading a book by uh, Joanna Michelson uh, uh, called The Beautiful Side of Evil. I think it came out in the early 80s. And she documents her own experiences through the New Age movement coming out of it and even kind of going back in and, uh, and uh, going to Mexico and some other places where they would do things called psychic surgery. And the uh, people would be sick and wounded or have cancer or whatever. And these guys would actually cut them open and reach in with their bare hands and pull out the cancerous tumor and just wipe over it. No bleeding, no nothing. The person would be healed and walked off. We're talking real supernatural stuff. Uh, it's, we fool ourselves that we don't understand the power of the devil and what he's able to do. Was that a good thing to heal somebody? Absolutely. Does it mean it's from God? Absolutely not. And that's... That's, that's the problem, because it's cloaked in religion or seemingly seems to be a good thing. Uh, it's, it's still, uh, Satan will use it to deceive. He's done it in the past, and it will be big time in the future. Uh, even within the church, people are deceived spiritually. And it's for a reason, because there's big money behind it. That's what uh, Peter tells us about in 2 Peter uh, 2.1. He says, uh, there are also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring into destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who, who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow, not a few, many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Verse 3, notice key word by covetousness, sometimes translated greed. They will exploit you with their deceptive words. It's for the money. Uh, again, Back about uh, 17, 18 years ago, there was a, quote, a faith healer named Robert Tilton that uh, uh, it was either 20, 20 or 60 minutes went in and, and somebody infiltrated it as a reporter and wore a wire and brought a camera, pretended to be one of their followers and worked their way up in the organization and then saw what was going on behind the scenes and then a big expose about them because he was a phony uh, and, and he was a fake. Uh, it was all a pretense. And he was bringing in, at that time, $80 million a year through donations. Uh, there's, there's a reason why people get into this and do this. Peter says it's because of greed, and that's exactly what we see. So spiritual deception, it's going to grow worse as we get closer to the time of the tribulation, but it will be huge in terms of the Antichrist uh, and the false prophet when that, that day comes. I just wanted to uh, read... Um, from an article by Eric uh, Groski. He's an AP writer. And uh, Charlie gave me this article yesterday called More Americans Are Blending Religions. Just a couple of statistics uh, from behind, uh, from the article. He says, though the United States is overwhelmingly a Christian country, I thought that was a pretty radical statement for an AP guy <laughs> to, <laughs> to admit to. Uh, significant uh, minorities say they hold beliefs of the sort found at Buddhist temples or New Age bookstores. 
24% of those surveyed overall and 22% of Christians say they believe in reincarnation, the idea that people will be reborn in this world again and again and again and again. Now, he stops after the second again, but that's the, uh, uh, the idea. I always wondered about this if you're, you know, because the idea within, within Hinduism is you, you work your way up the chain you know, but if you start as a cockroach, how do you be a good cockroach? You know, because you have to improve in your life in order to make the next jump. I don't, you know, I don't know that I've ever really seen a good cockroach. You, you know what I'm saying? But somehow you're supposed to be a really good cockroach, and then you might come back as a bird, then you, you'd be a really good bird. And, you, and you, once you reach manhood, then, then you've got to be the, the perfect man and reach godhood, or you start all over again. Of course, in the West, we don't really teach that. We just say, no, you come back as another person. But that's not really what reincarnation teaches. But uh, 20, 22% of people that are call themselves Christians say they believe in, in reincarnation. I'm not really sure which Bible they're reading. Uh, he goes on and says, white evangelicals and black Protestants are most likely, most likely to say that they've had a religious or mystical experience. Yet even those unaffiliated with any religion show a strong spiritual bent. Three in 10, 30% uh, reported having such an experience. Dr. Michael Lindsay, a Rice University sociologist for religion, said the results illustrates what he calls the playlist effect in contemporary American religious practice. The way we personalize our iPhones, we also personalize our religious life. <laughs> Pick and choose. Just pick the app, download it, there you go. That's my religion for today or, or for this week. And it's people being spiritually deceived. But it's true outside the church as well as inside, and we're all being set up for this time we call the tribulation, when a one-world religious system will be in power uh, and the false prophet as his, at its head will influence the world. He'll be an imposter and the third thing, the false prophet creates an image to be worshipped. We see that in verses 14 and 15. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the midst of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He has granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed." So he'll command that uh, an image to, of the beast be created. And, uh, and of course, the specific purpose will, will be to draw people to uh, the Antichrist, really to, uh, to worship him. And I don't think people will have a hard time with this. We, uh, you can't hardly go into a city park or a, a big uh, airport in a major city without seeing some kind of structure, some kind of image, some, some image to some god or demigod that used to be over that area, was imported from here or there or brought in. Hey, after all, it's only an artifact, you know, and, uh, and there's a little explanation there in a box uh, about it and so forth. Uh, of course, you can't set up anything about Jesus in any of those places, but uh, any other god will uh, will do. As we say within the school system, they have the ABCs. Anything but Christ is, uh, is welcome, welcome here. You can go in the office and if you're in Southern California, walk into any school in Orange County and get a copy of the Quran. They'd be happy to give you one. You just can't bring your Bible onto campus. People are being prepared for, uh, for these things. He'll command an image uh, of the beast to be created. And then secondly, he gives life to the beast uh, so that it can be Worship. It's able to speak, but it actually will, will breathe life, uh, the, the text says. Well, this is what's called the abomination that causes desolation. Daniel spoke about it, said that it would happen, said that it would happen according to a time clock of a seven-year period. It would happen right in the middle, uh, uh, three and a half years in. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, Standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the, the, the mountains. So uh, he not only has others create the image of the beast, and he speaks or breathes life uh, into it so that it becomes animated and, and so forth. And again, I, think, I don't think it's going to be like this kind of funky robot thing going on here, you know, worship the beast, worship. The, I think it's going to be pretty good. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> It's amazing how far animation has even come, but, uh, you know, in our, in our own day and age. But I don't think this is going to be a trick of technology 
uh, I think it's going to be something supernatural that, uh, that is uh, taking place. And where is it placed? It's placed in the newly rebuilt temple uh, there on the Temple Mount, and it's placed in the holy place where, where only God should be worshipped, the ultimate uh, blaspheming and what, uh, again, Daniel said, Jesus echoed, uh, the abomination that causes desolation. What's the desolation? Because once that happens, then, again, as we read earlier, uh, Satan, via the Antichrist, will unleash his fury uh, against the Jewish people, and that's when uh, uh, they will take the advice of, of Jesus and flee, and, uh, and that remnant will be protected out there in the Judean uh, wilderness or present-day Jordan. And, and, of course, we know that Jesus, when he returns for them, is in uh, Basra, because uh, Isaiah tells us that, and, uh, which is uh, current-day Petra, uh, Jordan. Where they're at that whole time, we don't know, but we know that's where the, the rescue comes to uh, at, at the end. Now, again, up until this time, you've got two, the two witnesses there in Jerusalem, uh, in the temple proper area, and as witnesses and proclaiming Jesus is the Messiah, call it, calling the people, the nation of Israel, and whoever else will listen to repent and come to faith in, uh, in Jesus. And, um, and again, we don't, uh, we don't know specifically who those two witnesses are, uh, but uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Dr. Fruchtenbaum says, uh, what the Bible says is they're two Jewish guys, so they're two Jewish guys. But of course, uh, it's hard not to speculate. And there's a lot, of, a lot of other writers that believe that they are Moses and Elijah based on the fact that we see those two guys showing up together previously on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses representing the Torah or the law, Elijah representing the prophets. And as uh, many rabbis have said today, if those two guys show up in Jerusalem at, at a rebuilt temple and they say, Jesus is the Messiah, I'll believe them. And uh, apparently people do. And there, there's a real turning to, uh, to, to the Lord. And, uh, so, but those guys are killed, lay in the streets, three days and three nights. The world gives gifts and rejoices over their death. And then they're, they're raptured to heaven. And at that point, then, we have the abomination that causes desolation. This is the opportunity that the false prophet has been waiting on. We've gotten rid of those guys. Now we can set up the image to be worshipped. Notice verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. And then he will take the life, three, uh, of anyone who will not worship the image of, of the beast. And uh, we can't help but uh, uh, relating that to a lot of the martyrdom that goes on today where uh, you know, where people will not deny their faith in Jesus Christ, and because of that, they are martyred, imprisoned, and so forth, as is in the case of some, not all, some Muslim countries, certainly in China, other places around the world. Again, more martyrs for faith in Christ in the last century than all centuries combined. Two-thirds of the Christian church today lives under persecution. We just happen to live in a country where there's less uh, persecution than in uh, than in most places, but uh, we have to, we think about the uh, the times of, of Daniel there in Babylon and their refusal again of uh, uh, his uh, his three buddies uh, refusal to bow down to the image of gold and they're thrown into the fiery furnaces as a result. I couldn't help think about a little trivia here. I got another, okay, here's here's the trivia question. And we got the image of the guy. The emperor going by, one guy standing, refusing to bow down. Now, I, I, I can't get you to guess the, uh, the name of the album because it's on there. Keith Green, No Compromise. What was the year of its release? I had a winner in the, in the first service. 75 was one of the guests? 77? We got 75, we got 77. 76, we're all around it. 78, I don't want you to go on a show. 78 was the year of its release. Significant, that was uh, when I accepted the Lord that year. Another guy named Bob Dylan got saved at about the same time. But uh, there, no compromise. That's, we'll have to change gears away from the trivia now. Look at the image again. So no compromise. That's what God's called us to today. People around the world are being martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ because of images like this. And it will be the same over a, a horrendous level during that time. People that say, 
well, I'm, you know, I'm not really sure about this whole Jesus thing now, but if I see you guys get raptured and the stuff you're talking about comes to be, then I'll know that it's really true. Then I'll give my life to Jesus Christ. And if you do, you're going to have to do that. You're going to be the one guy in the crowd that stands when everybody else is bow, and you will lose your life. So if you make that decision, then it will be towards martyrdom. Uh, and this will be a very, again, a very serious thing. We've got 144,000 other Jews that have received Jesus as their Messiah, and they have a seal of God over them, protecting them from his supernatural disasters that are being poured out on the earth and from protected from the Antichrist. They're out preaching the gospel. But everybody else, when they turn to faith in Christ, they're going to be martyred for their, their faith. So there's a tremendous influence that this person has. He's an imposter, creates an image to be worshipped. And, uh, and lastly, everyone will be included when it's time to take the mark of the beast. That's in the last two verses, 16 to 18. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So everyone will be included and will receive the, the mark of the beast. Notice small and great, rich and poor, free and slave. You will not be able to buy. You will not be able to sell unless you have this mark upon you. Notice the extent. It's the entire world that is subject to the demands of this particular uh, religious leader. We've already mentioned uh, it's in Revelation 7, the 144,000. They have a mark on them, a seal on them, and this seems to be kind of, again, the typical Satan trying to, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, copy or uh, mimic what, uh, what God is doing and will cause people to, uh, to take this seal. Now, this is uh, something that, uh, you know, we've talked about for, for years. If you've, uh, uh, you know, read Revelation before, read many books on, on prophecy and so forth. And, uh, you know, 30 years ago when, uh, when I was saved, we could already see through the uh, uh, you know, the coming age of the computer, how this would be implemented. But now we're on the other side of that, where we, we actually have it. We have the technology. Everything is, uh, is all ready to go. Uh, today, we even have a name for it. It's called a radio frequency uh, identification device, RFID, talked about uh, uh, in circles uh, economically, politically, and medically on a regular basis around the world. It's a little chip that would be implanted for a newborn, could be placed right under the hairline, very easily, one little stitch and it's done, no bleeding, no nothing, very easy, no, no nerve system developed there yet. Uh, on the forehead, for an adult, can be injected very quickly under the skin, already been done, already been test marketed, it's already, already out there, uh, and, and it's waiting for a system where then if you don't have the chip, you will not be able to buy, you will not be able to sell, and it's gonna be awesome, it's gonna be awesome, you know, because it's just gonna be fabulous, because, you won't have to worry about your identification being stolen anymore. You won't be able to be robbed by anymore. Reduction in crime will be awesome. No drug trafficking. How are we going to stop the Taliban? I mean, they're selling their opium and their poppies, and that's what funds you know, much of uh, what they do there in Afghanistan, that they import not only against our country, but to other countries and other Muslim countries that are moderate around the world. How are you going to? Well, this would stop it. We got a solution here. This is going to be awesome. How about medical emergencies? You know, hey, you know, here's a guy. He's passed out on the street. Scan his hand. We've got his name, address, his medical numbers, his medical records. We, this will save people's lives. This is going to be an awesome thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna, this is going to appear to be the best thing since sliced bread. I mean, this is going to be an incredible thing. Let me give you a couple of eight, uh, updates. Go back a few years, October 13th, 2004. Applied Digital announced that it had received the Food and Drug Administration approval for implanting its very chips in humans for medical purposes. So we, it's not if. We already got that going. That's been around for five years. Uh, December 15th, a couple months later, 2004. Since retailers like Walmart and Target have announced plans to use radio frequency identification tags on all products in the future, IBM has developed computer tools to assist manufacturers and mid-sized retail stores to use the technology. So we've, uh, we've got it. Uh, it's already in place in the uh, manufacturing world. 
In a research report uh, published by the Boston-based Yankee Group estimated that consumer good manufacturers in that year, 2005, will spend an average, an average of $7 million a year on this whole uh, RFID in terms of tagging food and products so that they can simply be... Is it, you got scanners at your store? Hey, son of a gun, you do. See, back in the days when I worked at Safeway, you went king, 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 king. You actually had to read a price off something. And uh, they also made us pick it up out of these baskets. See, I don't like that. You know, I did that all these years. Now I go to the grocery store. I'm still doing it. I'm unloading the basket. What, what happened to them, you know, providing that service? But uh, anyway, all this stuff is, uh, is, uh, is all in, uh, in place. One of the... Uh, uh, one of the guys in the church um, a number of years ago when Walmart first opened here, went on one of the uh, early days of, of the opening, not because he's in the sales, but I think he just needed to get something there. Uh, they had a, there a, um, the scanner set up like we're, we're used to, except the scanners that they had, they weren't able to use them because they shipped the wrong ones. You see, these had a handprint where you'd put your hand down and get scanned. Oh, yeah, they sent the wrong ones. They're, gonna, they're, they're using the other ones, the ones where the food items go. The ones for your hands, we're not using those yet. But they're there. <laughs> they're, they're, they're all ready to go. March 2005, following news announced made during the week of March 20, uh, 21st. MasterCard and Visa agreed on RFID protocol. MasterCard International and Visa International have reached an agreement to share a common communications protocol and associated testing requirement for RFID-based a contactless payments at the point of sale, according to a statement from uh, MasterCard. So uh, MasterCard and Visa International, they're all on board. They got their protocols. They're all set up. They're all ready to go on the cashless society, on the RFID chip being uh, implemented. July 20th, 2006, we're getting, so I'm talking ancient history, you know, 2004, 2005. So I'm bringing it a little closer now. 2006, Hewlett Packard had introduced Memory spots, small flat chips with an adhesive backing that can be attached to objects. They can store more than 250 times as much data as an ordinary RFID chip. Okay, we're making some progress now. We just had a light year jump in terms of uh, technology. They can transmit information 20 times faster. Now this thing will really work. Well, let's go a little closer. February 10th, 2009, the stimulus bill will track individual health care records electronically. I'm pretty sure that passed. The stimulus bill, have you heard that before? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that passed. Uh, and in that bill, there's a provision to create a national coordinator of health information technology that will assign an electronic ID to every person and maintain their health records. The goal is to reduce cost and guide your doc. Do you, you, you have one of those. You've got an ID. You have a national ID. Were you aware of that? You have a national ID now. Isn't that, this is going to be a blessing, boy, in the, in the future. Verichip plans to team up with Microsoft to make patient medical information readily available online. That's a good thing. Microsoft offers an internet program called Health Vault, where users can view their health data and can input helpful information. Of course, you have to have an ID to be able to do that and be able to get to it. So these are all... I didn't dig real deep for this stuff. This, is, this kind of information is just straight, straight out there, very, uh, very available. So we're, we're, it's not a speculation as how the, the, uh, this last world system will do this. It's all, it's all right there. It's all just waiting for someone to say, go. Now, one, one difficulty is you still have to have a one world currency because that's going to create problems uh, within this, uh, this computer system. Uh, and so we're, but we're close to that because of the uh, economy we're in, we're in right now. A plan to replace the dollar with a world currency originated with a Columbian University economics professor, Robert Mundell, who won a Nobel Prize in economics in 1999 for creating the euro and is now widely regarded as the father of the euro. And I got a picture of him. There he is. He's going to help us along, working for the Chinese right now, helping them with uh, uh, their economic concerns. Mundell is currently an economic consultant to China, the originator of the suggestion that the International Monetary Fund should utilize special drawing rights, or SDRs, to replace the dollar as a new standard for holding foreign exchange reserves in international trade transactions. To understand the concept, Mundell cites former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker. You ever heard that name before? Frankly quoted his dictum, a global economy needs a global currency. Again, 
he says the benefits from a world currency would be enormous. And, uh, and again, we're moving, moving towards that. This is one of the movers and shakers in the economic world today, the father of the euro. Mundell goes on and says, what you need to have is an international monetary fund that's going to take some of these excess dollars, such as held by China and foreign exchange reserves, put them into a substitution account inside the IMF or some other institution, and then use that to create what is a new international currency. So these are, uh, this is news. This is what's going on currently. Just in a lot of talk about this in the last two weeks uh, on the news and, uh, and on economic websites. I'm not talking about prophecy websites. I'm just talking normal economics, Fox Business News kind of, uh, kind of information that we've got here. So we, we live in a day when we used to speculate, what would it be like? We're on the other side of that. We're just reading about it now. We're not speculating anymore. We actually see what it's going to look like, what the chip will be, how it will be emulated in terms of everybody buying into this whole system and, uh, and receiving what we refer to as the, as the mark of the beast. And can you understand why Paul says, before the Antichrist comes on the scene, there's a restraining force that must be removed from the planet. And that restraining force is the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. When the church is removed at the rapture, do you think Christians around the world would have just a little bit of problem with the one world currency and having a chip implanted in your forehead or wrist? I think there's a few people going, I don't think, I don't think I'm going to do that. Uh, I think we'll just like uh, civil disobedience or something. We're going to shut this whole thing. We're not going to do this. We are a problem. Hey, the world, the world can move along and have peace, uh, medical breakthroughs, lives can be saved. Christians are the problem, especially the born-again Christians. Get your watered-down Christians. They'll go along with us on that. They think there's many roads that lead to God anyway. We can bring them right into this. These are the discussions that go on. The problem in the world today, according to much of the academic elite and the economic elite and government world leaders, the problem is born-again Christians. You guys, us, because we believe this is going to lead to a horrific time in, in this world and that it really is a satanic conspiracy. Of course, they, they, don't, they, they don't see it that way. They see it as trying to help humankind. But we live in those days. Okay, the Antichrist here is also identified with the number of a man. So I mentioned this earlier. Many attempts have been <laughs> made in the past to identify a particular individual. And the way that you do this is that uh, in Latin and Greek uh, and in Hebrew, uh, with each letter, there's a numerical value. You know, Greek have uh, alphabet, gamma, delta, you know, and so forth. So there's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you go through the alphabet. There's a, a number of signs. When, when you hit uh, nine, then you jump to 10. You go to 19, you know, you know then you jump to 21 and so forth till you uh, hit the end. Very, very common. Latin uh, and uh, Hebrew also, there are artifacts that have been found in the ancient world where there's a numerical value to them. Depending upon the language, you can compute the person's name associated with that, that item. So this is very common, common knowledge. So applying that, and many people have over the years, to a number. So the Antichrist or his name, they would say, is associated, his numerical value comes up to 666. So over the years, there's been all kind of speculation all the way back to the days of C Caesar Nero, right on through where you can take the name and if it's in Latin or if it's in Greek and you do this and multiply by this, then you get. And, but I've discovered, I've discovered who the Antichrist is. A person of tremendous influence on our culture, appears on television on a regular basis, actually focusing on a partic particular group within our own culture, and his name is Barney. Barney the dinosaur, and I'm going to prove that to you right now. Barney the dinosaur is the Antichrist. Now, I want to show you his name. Here we go. Cute purple dinosaur. That's what he is known by. And if we apply a numerical value to Barney, uh, we certainly want to change all the U's to V's because that's common Latin, so we, uh, we do that. And then we extract all the Roman numerals. See, there's some Roman numerals in there. We're going to extract those. Now we convert that to our numerical value, and we get 100, 5, 5, 50, 500, 1, and 5. And you add that up, and you get 666. Six, six. There he is. I've got a picture of him here. There he is. That's the Antichrist. You can entertain your friends and neighbors with that. 
But that's kind of what we've done over the years in trying to take this number and associate it with a, with a person. Literally in the Greek, when it says the number of a man, a uh, is not there. It's just the number of man. The number of man is 666. Always has been. He's just going to be a man that comes on the scene. But he's satanically inspired. He's satanically taken over and becomes this world leader. The number of God is seven. The number of perfection. Creation and uh, six days rest on the seventh. Uh, very, uh, very common in terms of uh, looking at numbers in the Bible. And the number of man has always been, uh, been six. Uh, it, it really, I don't think it means any more than that. I don't think you, uh, if I can make a case for Barney the dinosaur, you can make a case for about anybody. It, that number is not there to tell us so we can know in advance the guy's name. Uh, it's just to tell us it's a man and he's going to be raised up uh, and God's going to allow this and it's going to be Satan is cast out of, out of uh, heaven for the last time and he's furious in the last three years, we're at the midpoint, the last three years of the tribulation are going to be a horrific time. And, and the whole point is, is if this is the system that's instituted halfway in, and it's all in place now and ready to go, how, how close are we? Well, I'm reminded of the story of the little kid gra visiting his grandparents' house, and he, he would love to go in the living room where the grandfather clock was, around noon, because he would ch he loved to hear the chime, you know, bong, bong, and he would always go in because it would chime 12 times. Well, they were having a little problem with the clock, and he was in there, and it went, he starts counting, one, two, three, and he goes, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, <laughs> this kid keeps chiming, kid runs into the kitchen, grandma, uh, there's, some, there's something wrong, there's something terribly wrong, and she says, what is it? He says, it's never been this late before. It's never been this late before. Uh, if you're listening to a prophetic clock, it's chiming like 15 and 16 at this point. It's never been this late before. Well, let's pray. Lord, help us recognize the, the times that we live in. Think of the words of David to remember the brevity of life. It's like a vapor, Paul says. It comes and goes quickly. Lord, so pray that uh, we, would, we would recognize the times that we're, we're living in. We know that uh, the rapture of the church, the catching away of the church could occur at any time, uh, at any moment. There's nothing else prophetically on your clock that needs to take place for that uh, particular event. And then we know afterwards that the things that we're studying about now will begin to happen. Lord, I pray that, uh, again, I'm hoping that... Uh, the, the, the goal of, of the study is that you would, through it, give us a burden for the lost, that our prayer life would be, uh, would be changed and be uh, increased. Lord, and that we would just reach a point where we realize that it's, life is all short and the only thing that's really going to matter is uh, who we can take to heaven with us. Not that we can save anyone, but uh, Lord, it's your desire to speak through us as your ambassadors to a, a lost and a dying world. Lord, there's uh, oppression out there. There's spiritual deception that's out there. But Lord, you gave us uh, your word, the plumb line of truth through which we can hold it up against anything out there and measure and, uh, and not be deceived. Lord, so we, we thank you for that. Pray that uh, we would continue in your word as uh, workmen show ourselves approved, rightly dividing your word of truth. Lord, so that we wouldn't be deceived and we would be a, a benefit to those around us and you would use us to advance your kingdom in the hearts and lives of, uh, of people that uh, we love and care about. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you love this.